I'd like to share with you uh, three ways that I think businesses need to think differently about data if they're going to survive and thrive in the networked world that we now live in. But before I talk about those, I want to start with a, a story about an art history major I met recently. Uh, Vikram Somaya uh, studied art in college. He's fond of uh, quoting Shakespeare. Um, but his day job, he actually wrangles a lot of data scientists nowadays at a company called The Weather Company. Now, you know the, may know The Weather Company uh, from one of their brands. Uh, I certainly did, The Weather Channel, right? That's one of the apps I use the most frequently on my phone. Um, so I, I was certainly familiar and realized that uh, predicting the weather, certainly they have a lot of data. It's a very data-intensive process. But getting to know Vikram has really widened my thinking about what the value of that data might be for a lot of different businesses, you know, not just something like meteorologists and uh, you know, farmers, for example, I might have guessed. You know, one of the kinds of businesses that this data is very valuable for uh, is actually retailers. Uh, Walmart uh, has said that one of the biggest factors, most influential inputs into their whole uh, predictive modeling system on what they should be stocking, what is going to sell when, their whole merchandising planning, one of the biggest inputs is actually weather data. Right? Uh, and in fact, the weather company works with a lot of retailers around the country, helping them to know based on what the, what the weather will be in different locations tomorrow to predict what they should stock on the shelves, what ads they should be running, how much they should be spending on their real-time digital display advertisements at any given moment. Because different product categories, uh, allergy medications, uh, fleece, snow tires, there are all kinds of products which shift in terms of how much people are spending on them day by day based on factors like weather. But that's not the only thing they're doing with weather. They have a fascinating uh, uh, data initiative that they call the Weather Underground. Right? There are 25,000 uh, weather junkies, he calls them, uh, all over the world, most of them in the U.S., this is starting to go global, uh, who are actually spend hundreds of their own dollars to just personally buy uh, weather equipment, and they're actually setting up their own weather stations wherever they live, because they're really fascinated. And they pay a subscription to, to join this service of the weather companies. And actually, by joining the service, they are feeding in their own data. New weather stations, 25,000 of them, every two and a half seconds, feeding in new data points into the data set of the weather company, giving them much more robust, valuable, accurate, real-time information. They're also using this data to innovate even new products and services for unexpected categories, things like insurance. Uh, the weather company has helped build an app for insurers like State Farm. Uh, it's called Hail Zone. And basically what happens is, uh, if you are my insurance company and you're using this, 30 minutes before a hailstorm strikes where I actually am, knowing my location on my phone, 30 minutes before it strikes, I get an SMS alert telling me to move my car inside, right? That saves an unhappy experience for the customer, saves a lot of money for the insurer. Now, in this world we live in today, there are so many technologies that are shaping our experiences, our environment, and our businesses. And they are linked together in fascinating ways. But what I find most important is not just how they are linked to each other, but they, how they are linking us together into networks. Networks of customers, of businesses, of influencers, competitors, partners. These networks are an incredible force for both innovation and for disruption in pretty much every industry that I speak with these days. And so as I, as I teach executives and, and advise them, what I found looking at the changes they're going through, I really feel there are five different traits which define the organizations that are succeeding, that are managing to evolve, that are going to survive and really thrive in this new networked world. So one of them is the mastery of data, data as a core competency and a strategic asset. And that's what I'm going to talk about today, the power of data, or big data, if you will. Right? This has been a very exciting term, a lot of interest, a lot of discussion about it, uh, particularly in the press in the last year or so. But what is big data? Right? Uh, we've had data, certainly has been very important to businesses. A lot of businesses have had very large data sets for many years. Is anything qualitatively different really going on right now? 
Uh, and when I look at this question, I, I think there are some specific changes. I mean, certainly data is getting larger. All the measurements and estimates of how much a digital data is out there shows this kind of exponential curve. This is actually not new, though. If you look historically, uh, the history of recorded human information, I think there's basically been an exponential curve back to the invention of writing, of uh, human stored information. So yes, it's continuing to get larger and larger and larger. But I also think there are some very interesting changes that have just been happening in the last few years which are really changing the ways we can use data within organizations, and which is what I think is causing this disruption around this idea of big data. And these are changes really in terms of both types of data, which you can think of sort of sources of data, where they're coming from, and also some new kinds of tools, new tools for processing using new capabilities for harnessing data, which we really didn't have just even a couple years ago. So to look at those briefly, one of the big sources of data which is quite different and new, is social media, right? Social media is creating huge amounts of unstructured data, conversations happening on lots of different networks, images, words, text, and it's incredibly rich, right? We can mine social media data to find out about what people are interested in, what they're thinking about, what their perceptions are, who they know. Uh, if you know who I know, you actually know a lot of things about me due to uh, well-established patterns of homophily. Similar people tend to know each other. So all this data uh, creates a lot of new opportunities, but it's very unstructured. At the same time, it's already being tapped for a lot of insights. Twitter is being used uh, to track the spread of the flu and other infectious diseases uh, by groups like the CDC. Uh, the CIA is using social media to try and monitor and, and predict changes that are happening around the world. Uh, some, some folks are having some success using Twitter to predict the stock market. Uh, certainly movie box offices, uh, box office openings are being predicted uh, quite effectively now with social media data. So this is one whole new class of data we didn't really have just a few years ago. A second very interesting class of data is mobile data. Right? We've been talking about that since the morning. So mobile devices are not only giving off real-time data, but of course it is data that tends to be linked to our location. So that's very interesting when you overlay that with other kinds of information. So when search becomes local, it provides a lot of different information than simply what are terms people are searching on, like Google Trends, you can always go on and, and see which terms are, are trending. But with local search, you can say what are people searching on where? When they are in which places are they searching for what? Whole new insights can be unpacked. Foursquare has uh, over two billion data points about its users, where they like to be, when. Fascinating data sets. Thirdly, I see a lot of data now coming from uh, what is coming to be termed, I guess this is becoming the dominant term, the Internet of Things, right? Sometimes people will use the phrase machine web. Uh, you know, right now we think of the Internet as something people connect to, right? You've got your, your computer, nowadays you've got your smartphone, maybe your tablet. By 2020, Cisco predicts there will be 50 billion devices connected to the Internet. Now, fortunately, we are not going to have anywhere near 50 billion people. In fact, most of those devices are not going to be what we think of as uh, computing devices whatsoever. There are going to be thermostats. There are going to be sensors uh, that the doctors put on our skin. They are going to be machines, right? GE already has this. Their jet engines are linked to the Internet and giving regular status updates of all kinds of factors about them. Right? They actually call this uh, our Facebook for jet engines. Right? They have an app. And this allows mechanics to very easily monitor the fleet and see what's going on. As a result, uh, be much more efficient, much more effective, in, uh, and convenient in timing and regulating various kinds of maintenance and repairs. All right, so we have these new data sets, but we also have new tools for harnessing them, for analyzing them, because it's, it's quite challenging to make sense of a lot of this very large unstructured data. Well, one of the pieces of good news is uh, Moore's Law, right, which is uh, a familiar um, you know, estimate which is sort of held true. It was coined by uh, Intel's founder, Gordon Moore, which basically says that every two years, the ability of computing power and processing power will double within a given size, uh, you know, a given chip. And we've really seen this. That, that's held up uh, since he coined it for four decades. This is actually a picture of ENIAC. ENIAC was built in the 1940s. This was the first uh, true general purpose computer. It used vacuum tubes. I remember my, uh, my 
junior high school teacher telling me about it, basically filled a gymnasium, take about half of the space in this room. Um, and even when he told it to me in the 80s, he pointed out that my Texas Instrument uh, calculator uh, was much more powerful than ENIAC had been, right? So one of the trends we keep uh, experiencing is that really sort of last decade supercomputer is this decade's pocket computing device. So that's one trend which is making this more possible to, to analyze. The second is cloud computing, right? You think of something like Siri. Uh, Siri was really sort of the, the popularization of the idea of, of, you know, voice interface, voice recognition. Well, it takes a lot of data sets to figure out how to recognize what a person is speaking and what they mean. All that data and the processing power is not on your iPhone. It would not possibly fit, right? Which is why Siri only works when you're connected to the internet. The fact is, the rise of cloud computing software as a service means that you can have incredible analytical tools for big data, which may require tremendous processing power, but can be accessed in this very flexible mobile way by people uh, in all kinds of locations. The third trend is a rise of a whole new set of amazing analytical tools for and algorithms and tools for managing the data itself that can answer some fascinating and really amazing questions. Let me put one of these amazing questions to you. Can anyone in the room tell me what you see in this picture? It's a little fuzzy, so you might have some trouble, but can anyone tell me, can you see anything in this picture? No? Yes, down in the front, what do you see? A cat playing the piano. That is amazing. Did you know that this is an incredibly hard question to ask of a computer, right? The best computers in the world have been stymied by that question, that kind of question, because this is video, right? Video is an incredible source of unstructured data. I mean, look at the stats from YouTube, incredible creation of video all the time, but how do you index it? How do you tag it? How do you measure it? How do you sort and search on it? It has been a huge challenge, right? It is a challenge we're starting to make pro uh, a progress on, pattern recognition, there was a fascinating experiment recently completed by Microsoft. They actually tied together 16,000 computer processors into a neural network, and they applied a new pro approach called machine learning. Rather than telling it what was a cat and saying even, here's a bunch of cat pictures, see if you can find more cats, they let it figure out on its own. They let the computers learn on their own. And eventually they got to the point where they can tell what is a cat in YouTube. We're seeing all sorts of amazing tools, uh, Hadoop for managing unstructured data. Um, one of the uh, tools is actually natural, one of the approaches is natural language processing, right? And this was uh, unveiled recently by uh, IBM. Uh, a couple years ago, they showed off their Watson uh, program, which is able to understand natural spoken English. It actually was able to play the game Jeopardy and beat uh, world-class Jeopardy champions because it's able to process and read and understand you know, millions of documents and data sources without them having to be coded for a computer, just reading normal language. All right, so what does this mean for businesses? How can we use these new data sets and these new tools for analyzing them? As I said, I think there are three important ways. First of all, uh, businesses can use them as a source of insights for dis data-driven decision-making. Uh, many different ways. One is through predictive analytics, right? understanding the probabilities of something happening in the future. There are startups like Custora. Custora works with uh, e-commerce companies. They measure based on your behavior, they can make an estimate of your lifetime customer value. So not just what you've done on the site, we know whether you're likely to convert or not, but what is your value over the whole lifetime to this firm gonna be? After you make one purchase, Custora can estimate you will probably make six purchases in the next year, totaling about $275 in value, putting you in the top 5% of our customers, right? Just based on that one thing you did decide to buy and how you went through buying it. But predictive analytics is not just the only kind of insight that can be derived. We can also get insights into things like brand perceptions. Uh, my colleague Oded Netzer, who teaches in my, my digital strategy program, um, he presented some great research last year. Uh, some of you probably saw it. But really, it was about looking at customer conversations, these unstructured social data, and understanding things like what words are associated with which automotive brands, right? Finding things that, like, uh, I think it was the Toyota Corolla that was more frequently cited in regards to um, 
uh, moms and daughters, but also plastic interiors, right? Compared with the Honda, which had different words associated with it. Very important insights for marketers to understand. He can also measure using the same uh, text mining, he can measure how perceptions are changing over time. So he looked at the case of Cadillac, which spent millions of dollars over the last few years trying to shift their perception from being really a classic American car, like a Lincoln, to being more of a global luxury brand, like a Lexus, and was actually able to see the shifts in conversations, in brand perception, as well as in actual purchase behavior. So insights from data can yield answers to many of the most important questions that marketers are thinking about. Who should I market to? Which are my most valuable customers? How should I personalize my offer, et cetera? But insights are only one piece of the puzzle. Data can offer other things to us as well. Data can actually be a resource for innovation, innovation of new products, new services, new value for your customer, which wasn't possible before. Let me give you an example. Nike is a brand uh, that is very interested in data. Uh, they work with a lot of data geeks, uh, including my friend here, John Mayo Smith. But it's really not about data to figure out how to, say, target advertisements. It's about how to create a better experience for our customers. Uh, one of the ways they've done this is they've discovered that a lot of athletes are really excited about measuring themselves. There's a whole movement known as the quantified self. And so they're, they're recording their workouts, they're measuring how they match up against certain goals, they're, they're uh, sharing it with others. And Nike has discovered this and used this to build a whole series of products, services, and online communities to better engage those customers. The latest one is actually the fuel band, right? This is a digital wristband you wear around your wrist. It allows you to measure your activity throughout the day. Um, you know, uh, whether you're running or walking, or going upstairs, uh, playing basketball, whatever it is, it's capturing all that exertion. And it allows you both to measure for yourself, to get gaming sort of feedbacks, right? You get a badge or a reward because you've, you've hit your goals three days in a row. To share it if you choose with friends. And it's really created an amazing product which is really about the future of where Nike sees itself, not just about apparel, but about brand experiences, about exercise and athleticism. Another great uh, product innovation that I personally used uh, is Waze. Waze is a, a wonderful navigation app. It's got about 30 million users right now. The thing is, when I turn on Waze and I start driving, it looks like a regular turn-by-turn -turn navigation, but simply because I have it on, it is measuring my movement in the car down the street, and it's feeding it in real time back to Waze, so it knows in real time what the traffic conditions are by where its users are going, how fast, on each stretch of road. When a traffic jam happens, within minutes, Waze has detected it, and it's rerouting me simply because someone a quarter mile ahead of me has slowed down. You can even have the option, you can feed into it yourself, you can uh, tap on the screen to let other drivers know if there's a police car ahead or an accident or a road that's been closed. It's an incredible resource pulling the, da the, the data of its users, uh, and I'm really excited to see where this is going to grow. Apple tried to buy it last year unsuccessfully, um, so I think they're seeing a lot of value in this company. Which points to the third way that businesses can use data, which is really as a strategic asset. Right? A lot of the power of, of Waze is really that data set that it holds. Data sets are becoming core assets for all kinds of businesses. Um, Speaking of politics, as we've mentioned, uh, in the last election, both parties had approximately 450 data points on every single voter in America. All right? So incredibly critical to the functioning of you know, that, that market, if you will, the competition for voters. Um, what happens to that data? Actually, on the, on the Democratic side, a lot of the data is not with the National Party. It was with the Obama campaign, and so now there's this whole kind of question, what happens to Obama for America? It's, it's morphing, so we will see what happens to that data set. Um, Google Maps, of course, has a tremendous data set, which it's put a lot of resources into building, um, both you know, sending drivers out on the streets with street view, buying data sets. They have scientists hand cleaning the data from all over the world continuously. The value of that data set uh, became pretty apparent last fall when Apple announced they were pulling out, no longer using Google Maps, right? Going to use their own. And of course, it led to a disastrous customer experience, which was so bad you had a very rare public apology by the CEO of Apple, who actually told customers they should go use the competitor's apps until Apple managed to improve its data set. 
One more example. We heard this morning about media companies who are starting to act like transaction or e-commerce companies. But I'm also finding that commerce, e-commerce and transaction companies are becoming media companies, right? Because of the value of their data. Travel agencies have a lot of traffic to their site, and they're actually finding their data about their users is much more valuable to advertisers than just the data maybe a Facebook or even a Google can give. They don't know not only who you are, what you're maybe thinking about buying, they can actually tell you this customer has booked a trip, is going to be in the city at this time. If you're trying to advertise for people in that location, that's a great audience. Now, they're not telling you by name, but they're saying, I will sell you advertising space only against customers who are going to be in Austin that week, for example. Right? In fact, they're not only monetizing these data that they've discovered they have, they're actually pulling it together into data markets where they're sharing with their direct competitors because as a result, the value of all the data sets becomes much higher, and they're all getting a greater yield for their firms. So in this networked world, data will play an increasingly important role for all of us and for every organization. We need to think about three different ways of using data as a source of insights, as a resource for innovation, and as a key strategic asset. I want to leave you with one last story which touches on this. Watson. Right. The IBM supercomputer used to play Jeopardy. Well, after the Jeopardy win, Watson went into a residency, if you will, at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Two years studying medicine, uh, quickly surpassed the book learning of the average medical student, went on to focus on cancer. It's actually read now and learned two million uh, research articles, one and a half million patient records. And so it was taken out and has been working as sort of an intern, if you will, helping out the doctors. It's a diagnostic tool, crossing, you know, cross-tabbing all the information uh, from all these previous cases to make predictive recommendations for a given patient, what might be the best treatment. In fact, at this point, there's some cancers, it's diagnosing at a much higher accuracy rate than the average doctor. It's now going out into the world. It's gonna be a, uh, an app. People can connect to it at any hospital using the cloud, simply on a tablet, right? Pose a question, natural language, just type in however you want to express it as a doctor, get an answer back within minutes, even seconds. Now some people I know look at this and they think, the end of the era of the doctor. We won't need doctors anymore, right? We're just going to have Dr. Watson. But I think they're missing the point. The fact is, Watson is really just a diagnostic tool, just like the stethoscope, the MRI. And in fact, all the data which is analyzing, all the insights it's pulling together, is actual research done by human doctors, right? It can't conduct any of these experiments. I think the lesson here is that to unleash the power of big data, we need to combine both the data and the tools with the human, the human and the algorithm. And by tying together big data with creativity and intuition and the best of our own experience and insights, any organization will be able to thrive and use it to grow in the digital age. Thank you.